Good morning. I am Brian Kloppenberg, and I will be presenting a talk on the interferometric results from the recent Epsilon RIG eclipse. But before I get started, I would like to take a moment to thank the conference organizers for letting me present my talk in this format rather than in person. Um, at present, my wife and I are moving back to the U.S. from Germany, and it wasn't clear uh, whether we would be in Europe or in the U.S. at the time this conference occurred. So uh, thank you again to the organizers for uh, accommodating my situation. Now, the work I'll be presenting is uh, a combination of efforts by 18 other individuals and myself, uh, and they're all listed here on the slide. Of course, uh, Bob Stencil, who was my advisor at the University of Denver, is quite uh, involved with this project. And then also uh, Hal McAllister, who will be presenting a talk on optical interferometry later this week, uh, is also uh, involved as well. So either one of these individuals would be a, a good person to talk to uh, in the case that uh, I'm not available for just, uh, answering questions uh, via Skype after this talk is done. Uh, I'll also provide my contact information on the last slide as well as a QR code that you can scan with your smartphone. Uh, in case you want to um, download a copy of this presentation and or slides or contact me at a later date. Okay, so uh, an overview of my talk. Uh, when I looked over the list of participants, I saw about uh, 10 names that I recognized as having uh, published before with optical interferometric data sets, uh, but because there were so few of them, I thought it was probably a, a good idea to discuss what our data products are and then how we do image reconstruction, because this is uh, significantly different from what you might be used to if you've uh, done any work with radio inter interferometric data in the past. That'll take about 10 minutes. And then the remaining 20 minutes of my time will be spent discussing the data sources for this project, how we do artifact assessment, the models that we have created and the results that we've obtained, and also how we're applying advanced statistical methods to derive more realistic uncertainties from the data. Okay, so uh, optical interferometers are a lot like radio interferometers in that you have to combine the light from multiple individual telescopes in order to create interference patterns. And these interference patterns are the fundamental observable of both types of interferometers. However, in the radio regime, where the coherence time is quite long, you can actually record the data from individual telescopes <clears throat> and uh, with, with a high time resolution counter, and then play that data back through some form of a correlation system to create the fringes a long time after your data was actually obtained. However, at optical wavelengths with a coherence time is much shorter on the order of a few milliseconds, um, we're actually forced to record, uh, we'll create the fringes in real time. Now this creates a couple of different problems. The first of which is the atmospheric effects are quite bad to the point that even though we measure complex visibilities, we can't calibrate them because the phase information is so garbled by the, the changing wavefront through the atmosphere. So instead of observing complex visibilities, um, we, the, the calibratable quantity is actually the visibility squared, which is just simply the, uh, the modulus squared of the complex visibility. Uh, the one interesting product, that, uh, an additional interesting product that we can form is called the triple product, also known as the bispectrum. And this is just simple, the, simply the multiplication of three complex visibilities around a closed triangle of telescopes. Uh, so from this, we get a quantity called the triple amplitude, and then also the closure phase. And the closure phase is a very interesting quantity because it can actually cancel out some of the atmospheric phase information. Uh, for instance, if you look at the diagram that I have here on the left, there's this cloud that exists above telescope two, and we'll, we'll call that um, you know, the, 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 the phase, it's going to be introducing some phase from the atmosphere. So if you look, uh, what happens is the phase that's introduced along baseline one, two is equal in magnitude, but opposite in phase of what you get along baseline two, three. So when you sum the phases between telescopes one, two, two, three, and three, one, you end up canceling out the, the, uh, that additional phase quantity that was introduced by the atmosphere. So that's a, it's a very nice uh, way of getting some information about the asymmetry in the system. If you spectrally disperse your data, you can also form differential quantities like the differential visibilities and differential phases. And then if you have a facility with four or more telescopes, you can form a quantity called closure amplitudes. All of the interferometric data uh, is stored in a registered FITS convention called OIFITS, and that's what most modeling software uses today. Now, most people have been using data from uh, interferometers with just a few number of telescopes, and so they've been doing pretty much model fitting. However, now with three or more telescope interferometers, 
you can actually form images, but unfortunately, optical interferometric imaging is an incredibly ill-posed model fitting problem. Now, what, what do I mean by this? So if we think about model fitting, it's actually a well-posed problem in which you have many more data points than you have number of parameters. And you have a very small number of parameters, and they're often of some form of different physical nature, so you can constrain them in order to keep them physical. However, with image reconstruction, you're still doing model fitting, except for you have a high number of identical parameters. For instance, consider making a, an image that's 128 pixels on a side. So 128 by 128 is 16,384 identical parameters that you need to fit, basically the flux in each pixel. So it's an incredibly ill-posed model fitting problem in which you have significantly fewer data points than you have number of pixels. Therefore, you have to include some kind of prior information in order to regularize the solution. Now, in order to do this uh, image reconstruction, we apply Bayes' theorem, in which on the left-hand side of this equation, we wish to find the most probable image given the data and the imaging model. Now, this uh, for a single image reconstruction, the quantity in the denominator on the right-hand side, the marginal likelihood, will be constant. Therefore, uh, all we have to be concerned about are the prior and the likelihoods. The priors are pretty easy to figure out, uh, but the likelihood is a little bit tricky. Now, turning your attention to the lower left-hand corner of the slide, uh, you can see that instead of using just a straight likelihood, we're actually using a regularized maximum likelihood, which consists of a chi-squared-like formulation, uh, which is just a standard chi-squared, so it's a goodness of fit to your data, plus some form of regularization function that's multiplied by a regularization weight. And this is where things get tricky with an optical interferometry. The question is, which regularization function do we use? And here's a, a visual example of how this can change the, the way our images look. On the left-hand side, I, I show uh, an image uh, taken from Stephanie Renard's paper of uh, M51. And then on the right-hand side, that four-pack of images is actually reconstructions of this image using four different regularizers. Uh, in the top middle is the total variation regularizer, which attempts to minimize the grading of the image. And so it pr introduces basically kind of a stair-step pattern in flux, uh, which is fairly apparent in this image. Now on the right-hand side, you can see the compactness regularizer, which penalizes images that have single pixels or small groups of stray flux. And so it tries to essentially pull all the flux into uh, more compact blobs. There's also the L2 norm, which is in the bottom, uh, the bottom center, and then off to the right is the maximum entropy regularizer, uh, which is uh, quite often used uh, in interferometry. Now, let's say you've picked a regularization function that you think it has some properties of what your object is going to be represented by. The next question is, what value do you use for the regularization multiplier? Uh, again, on the, the top left, we see the original image of M51. Now, let's say that we pick a regularization weight that's too low. That means that there's going to be a lot of emphasis placed on the chi-squared, and so you can end up overfitting your data. So you end up with an image uh, like what you see in the lower left, where there's a lot of stray flux because you're just basically overfitting the data. However, if you pick a regularization weight that's too high, you end up picking up properties of the regularizer and uh, not as many properties of the data. And so you end up with an image like what's reconstructed to the lower right. Uh, however, someplace in the middle, uh, you can form a, a perfect image if you can find that happy sweet spot. Okay, now for the second half of my talk. Our data come from four different beam combiners located at three different interferometric facilities. The facilities are Georgia State University's Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy, or CHARA, the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer, or NPOI, and the Polymer Testbed Interferometer, or PTI. A majority of our data come from CHARA, therefore that's the facility that I pictured at the bottom of the slide. CHARA is located on Mount Wilson in California, uh, and it consists of six one-meter telescopes that are spaced a maximum of 331 meters apart. The light from each telescope is gathered and sent through a series of evacuated tubes into the beam combination facility, which is located near the, the middle of this, uh, this image in the shadow of the 100-inch telescope. Uh, the, the beam combination facility consists of delay lines to normalize the optical path difference and also the beam lab where the beam combiners are housed. When this project was started back in 2008, it was quite difficult to get data, and our typical UV coverage, or coverage in the complex plane, if you will, looks a lot like what you see here on the left-hand side. This is the equivalent of one observation with three telescopes uh, using Merck. You'll notice that the UV points are not just singular in the complex plane, they actually have a little bit of radial spread. That's because Merck has a, a small amount of spectral dispersion. 
When the eclipse started in 2009, we were able to get a significantly higher quantity of data because uh, first off, Merck was using four telescopes, so we automatically had a few more baselines. And then we also had several nights of observations. In this particular case with the center image, it's the equivalent of three nights of observations. By the time our uh, program ended in 2009, after the eclipse had completed, the Merck beam combiner was upgraded to six telescopes. And uh, you can see just from one night of data, uh, we were able to get equivalent, if not better, UV coverage than uh, at any other time uh, during our program. So before we get too deep into the images and the modeling sections, I thought I would take just a moment to discuss the images in detail. Uh, for instance, the, the image that you see here on the screen should appear square. If it's not, then the, the resolution of the, the monitor or the, the projector is probably just a little bit off. Uh, but let's imagine that it's square. Uh, all of the images that I will show you are drawn in the tradi traditional astronomical sense, namely north is up and east is to the left. The grid in the background will always be a half milliarc second in size. Uh, so this uh, image is 3 milliarc seconds by 3 milliarc seconds. The, uh, the resolution of the array, uh, at least in H-band, is half of a milliarc second, which is located, uh, indicated by the resolution circle in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, in all of the images, you will also see a gray inscribed circle, which denotes the angular diameter of the F-star, which is determined by model fitting. Okay, now turning our attention to the color representation in the image, this is the model independent reconstruction. And when I say model independent, uh, the only assumptions that go into this is that the image can start from something that is completely black and that the entropy can be, be derived from a 1.4 milliarc second Gaussian. Uh, we do not put any form of prior in uh, with these images. Uh, so they're, they're, they're not artificially formed, and we do not enforce anything else in terms of roundness or, or anything. These, these are just uh, what come out of the, the pipeline with absolutely no additional assumptions. Now, with that said, the, the image doesn't quite look entirely right. For instance, there's this, this uh, dark lane that goes through the southern half of the star. Well, we previously attributed that to the disk, uh, and that's discussed in our, our Nature paper from 2010. Uh, but beyond that, there's also some other artifacts that we need to discuss. For instance, if you, if you look along the, the middle of the, the disk, there appears to be this kind of scalloped appearance here. Uh, now, is that an artifact or is that actually a real? There's also these three bright spots which appear along the equator. Is that real or is that fake? There's a dark spot in the northern hemisphere. The star doesn't appear right around. And uh, if the contrast is good enough on the projector, you might also be able to see the southern pole of the star is actually visible. Can we trust any of these artifacts, uh, or, or are, they, are they actually something that's real? So in order to assess this, we've uh, created a, a method to, to check uh, the, for the presence of artifacts in the images. Uh, because uh, OI image reconstruction is a fairly new field, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to generate errors. Matter of fact, there's only one image reconstruction program which even generates error maps uh, at the present time. Uh, so to, to assess what's actually real and fake in these images, what we've done first is we've reconstructed the images using the bispectrum maximum entropy method, or BSMEM. That's the leftmost column uh, of these, these figures that we see here, taken at two different uh, epochs. Then we found the best fit model to the interferometric data, low, the images of which are in the middle column here. And then in order to create the images on the right, we've sampled the model with the exact same UV coverage as the original data. Uh, and this essentially created a perfect interferometric observation. And because we know that, the, that there's a lot of things that are not perfect in the system, we've redistributed the nominal values of this perfect observation according to the, the error bars in the original data. So this, we've essentially created a, a noisy observation of the model image. Then we take this synthetic interferometric data and reconstruct it using the exact same method that we used on the real data. So now looking across a single row in this image, this is how we're going to assess our artifacts. First, we're going to look for differences between the model and then the reconstructed model. Anything that's different between the two of them is likely an artifact. And then uh, we look for differences between the model or the, the reconstructed model on the far right and then the real image on the left hand side. Anything that's different between those two is probably something that's going to be real. So let's do this first on the top row of images. For instance, you can notice that in the real image on the left-hand side, we see this kind of scalloped edge which appears, and that also appears in the rightmost image, uh, but is not present in the model. Therefore, that's actually going to be an artifact. 
Likewise, the three bright spots, which uh, I've denoted with the red arrows, appear in both the original image and in the model image, but not in the interferometric model in the middle. Therefore, those are artifacts. Now, looking at the bottom side of the images, uh, or the, the, the bottom row of images here, you can see that there's a dark spot in both the uh, original image and in the model image, but not present in our interferometric model in the middle. Therefore, that dark spot that you see is an artifact. However, in all of the images that we see up here, there is, uh, we, we predict that there should be a small amount of the southern pole of the star which should still be visible. It's present in our model, it's present in our reconstructed model, and it's also present in the original data. Therefore, we actually are seeing the southern pole of the star. Now I can show you five of our 14 model independent interferometric images taken during the eclipse. Uh, on the left, the, the group of three and the top left are the ingress images taken in uh, November, December of 2009, and then again in February of 2010. Uh, on the two leftmost images, you have seen a, a variant of those uh, published in the, the Nature article from a couple years ago. Uh, the February observation is actually quite interesting, and I, I hope you can see this because uh, I know the contrast on projectors is not very good, but the southern pole, which would be located about right here, is completely absent. And uh, our models predict that the southern pole actually should be absent at this particular time because of the, the lower amount of flux and then also the additional uh, coverage of the northern hemisphere. Uh, so we, we think the, the southern cap was actually covered at this particular epoch and it's supported both by interferometric and by photometric data. Now the image on the top row on the right is taken during August of 2010. That was mid-eclipse. Notice that you can't see through the disk. Uh, the disk is completely opaque in the midplane. Therefore, this is incredibly strong evidence against the mid-eclipse brightening hypothesis. Uh, and if you'd like to talk about this a little bit more, uh, we, we can discuss it uh, over Skype, or perhaps if uh, Bob wants to, he can talk with you about that as well. Finally, down at the bottom is our, our only image that we reconstructed using uh, the climb beam combiner at Chara. Uh, at this time, uh, in uh, April of 2010, the Merck beam combiner was being upgraded to uh, six telescopes, so it wasn't available to use. Uh, climb is a three telescope beam combiner, and it has no spectral dispersion. Therefore, the UV coverage is comparatively bad with all of the other epics, but yet we're still able to recover a fairly nice image. Uh, you can see here in the northern portion of the star that we can clearly see that the northern hemisphere is still exposed. And then along the uh, eastmost edge of the star, we can see that the, uh, the hemisphere, I guess not hemisphere, but the eastmost limb of the star is starting to be exposed while the disk is moving out to the northwest. Now the question becomes, how are we going to model the disk? Because there hasn't been a whole lot of literature published on this. For instance, there's the, the brick of the disk that appears in uh, Huang's uh, publication in 1965. Uh, Kemp modified the model a little bit more in uh, 1986 by suggesting that the, the disk is inclined, uh, and Jack Lissiauer uh, proposed that the disk has some form of uh, vertical opacity, uh, but uh, that that model would have been a little bit too difficult for us to implement. So what we've done is we created two different sets of software which solve a lot of the problems that we were faced. First, we created this OpenCL interferometry library, or LibOI. This is a GPU computing library for optical interferometry. And what it does is it, if you give it an image and you give it an OIFITS file, it will do all of the, the Fourier transforms and all of the, the data simulation that you need to to create simulated observations. And this is an incredibly fast program. It can perform about 280 uh, images to reduce chi-squareds per second, and this is about 150 times faster than the exact same algorithms implemented on the CPU. Meanwhile, we also created uh, our modeling software, which is called the Simulation and Modeling Tool for Optical Interferometry, or SimToy. And this is kind of a, a very uh, interesting application of computer graphics in that we're using the same uh, thing that they use to make video games in doing interferometric modeling. The nice thing about this is that our environment is entirely three-dimensional, time-dependent, and we can implement astrophysical orbits and, and other processes that, uh, that are involved fairly easily. We have several different minimization engines, uh, and we can use different scripting languages to execute functions, uh, and it also uses the, the uh, GPU computing library uh, as a fast backend for doing the computations. So if we just take and consider the Huang-like disk model, uh, which was a cylinder seen uh, in projection, 
uh, we can actually pull out just a few hints of uh, the orbital parameters once we pick a disk model. For instance, if the disk has a hard edge and it looks like a cylinder, uh, we can determine the total orbital semi-major axis just by fitting the photometry. Here in the top left-hand corner, you can see what happens if we go from 15 milliarc seconds, which is this top green dashed line, to 40 milliarc seconds. Uh, for the, the total orbital semi-major axis. This is the distance between the F star and whatever is at the center of the disk. Uh, so if it's very far away, the disk has to go very quickly across the F star, whereas if it's quite close, uh, it actually matches pretty well. Uh, on the top right-hand corner, we can determine the orbital inclination fairly easily. Uh, if you have uh, an orbit that's viewed edge on, you get a fairly flat eclipse depth. However, if you have an orbit that's uh, slightly more inclined, the bottom of the eclipse becomes more rounded. Likewise, uh, it would, this, this was actually a fairly surprising result to me, is that um, the, uh, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, we can determine the height of the disk from the photometry quite well. Uh, actually well below the resolution of the interferometer. So this is where combining interferometry and photometry leads to incredibly precise definitions of some of our parameters. So uh, as you can see, just changing the eclipse depth, or the, the height of the disk from 0.7 milliarc seconds to 0.85 milliarc seconds leads to an uh, increase in the uh, eclipse depth by about a tenth of a magnitude. Oh, well, actually about two tenths of a magnitude here. Um, this, keep, keep in mind that this is an increase of 0.15 milliarc seconds, whereas the angular resolution of the beam combiner is 0.5 milliarc seconds. So we're exceeding the, the resolution of the array by five times by including the photometric data. And then finally, off to the bottom right, we can see what happens to the light curve if we take this disk and we tilt it slightly out of plane. And by as much as one degree, you can introduce some fairly strong asymmetries in the light curve. Uh, and we, we find that there's uh, actually no evidence for supporting the disk being tilted out of the plane uh, of the orbit. Okay, now uh, because we, we had to try to decide how to model this disk, it, it became fairly uh, evident quite early on that a solid cylinder is probably not a very realistic representation for the disk. So what I did was I took all of the interferometric images and my best guess at what the orbit was, predicted the position of the F star uh, as a function of time, and just put all of the images together in Photoshop. And here's what you can see what, uh, what we have here on the left-hand side of the screen. This is essentially an image of a silhouette of the disk. So what we've done uh, is really hold the disk fixed in a single position and allowed the F star to slide behind it uh, and, and uh, lighting different sections of the disk as it goes. The ingress epochs are over here to the right hand side, whereas mid eclipse is about right here. Again, notice you, you can't see through the center of the disk. And then uh, a series of the, the remaining epochs are off to the left hand side. And at the time I didn't have the egress observation, so I didn't include it in this figure. Notice that throughout everything from mid eclipse, well actually even from the beginning of eclipse, uh, through the mid eclipse phase and towards the end of the eclipse, we can still see the bottom section of the F star. So that means that we have incredibly tight constraints on how thick this disk actually is. And when I looked at this image, uh, and when Bob looked at this image, uh, we both immediately started thinking of protoplanetary disks uh, seen in the Orion Nebula. So that's kind of an idea of where we, we were inspired to uh, derive our models. So what we did is we created five symmetric disk models uh, to fit to the interferometric and the photometric data. Here we can see uh, all five of them listed here. The top uh, number one model is that of a cylinder seen in projection. That's why instead of appearing just as a, a rectangle, uh, there's actually a small amount of curvature to the, the top and bottom sides. Models two through five are a series of concentric rings which have some form of opacity function, uh, actually in this case a transparency function, uh, as a function of radius or height. So model two, uh, which is our, our second row here, is this concentric ring model with a power law radial transparency. Model three has both radial and height dependent transparency. Model four is only height dependent transparency. And model five uh, has only radial transparency, but it also permits there to be a central clearing in the disk. Now, uh, looking at models two and four, you may not be able to distinguish the two of them. Uh, that's because these are actually our best fit models to what the disk should actually look like. 
and models two and four uh, come incredibly close to each other in terms of uh, uh, matching all the observables. Uh, notice that model five, uh, in order to match both the photometry and the interferometry, it actually implies that the disk has to be fairly transparent because uh, the, the opacity here you see is equivalent to the opacity that you would actually see on the F-star. Um, so uh, it's, it doesn't look very good for the, the mid-eclipse brightening hypothesis. Okay, so now using these symmetric disk models, let's look and see what the photometry looks like. Uh, here I show a plot of the H-band photometry versus, uh, versus time. Uh, if you look at the bottom, there are a series of tick marks. Uh, those tick marks ma uh, uh, represent when there were interferometric observations. Uh, you might notice that some of the tick marks, for instance right here for NPOI around 5200, appear a little bit thicker. Uh, that's because there were several interferometric observations right in a row, and so the, they just kind of stack up on each other. Now, the uh, photometry shows that using all five of these disk models, we can actually predict the light, the light curve uh, quite well, actually. Uh, model 1, which is this, this green line here, uh, that shows the cylindrical model. It doesn't do a very good job of representing the eclipse light curve, but it actually fits the interferometric data quite well. Uh, likewise, uh, models 2 and models uh, 5, sorry, 2 and 4 are these bottom two lines here which predict the eclipse was actually quite deep in the February observation, but then there's some form of asymmetry between the photometry that we predict and the photometry that's observed. And then finally, the mid-eclipse uh, brightening disk, uh, which was uh, model five, basically splits the photometry uh, between this first half and the second half of the eclipse. However, we can immediately arrive at one conclusion. If we assume that the disk is symmetric and we simulate both the photometric and the interferometric observations, we immediately come to the contradiction that the disk is actually asymmetric because it does not match the observed photometry. So let's uh, look at some of the interferometric results now. Uh, again, up at the top hand side of the screen, I show the uh, H-band photometry as a function of time as well as uh, disk model two, which is actually my best fit model. Uh, down at the bottom, these three bottom plots show uh, on the top the diameter of the F-star as a function of time, the limb darkening parameter of the F-star as a function of time, and the height of the disk as a function of time. You'll notice there are these green bands that go horizontally across every single one of these plots. Those green bands represent the uh, nominal value and the uncertainty uh, from model two, which is the, the green trace that you see in the photometric plot up at the top. Okay, so first off, with the diameter of the F-star, I apologize because this is a mix of both limb darkening and uniform disk diameters, but you can see generically that the diameter is actually fairly consistent for the F-star, regardless of eclipse phase, certainly within one sigma. Likewise, the limb darkening coefficient is, is quite consistent across the epochs uh, in the, the second plot that you see there. Something that's quite interesting about the height of the disk as a function of time is that between our different interferometric facilities, black being Merck and orange being the Navy, the Enpoi facility, uh, they agree at a lot of the epochs. However, there are a couple observations where the disk is predicted, or I should say observed, to be significantly thicker. Uh, and these are the February observations, uh, uh, February and April, actually, from uh, Merck and from Enpoi. The disk is predicted to be a little bit thinner uh, near mid-eclipse and thereafter, and then during egress, the disk uh, actually uh, jumps fairly significantly in size. Okay, lastly, uh, just to take the last few seconds of my talk, I would just like to mention how we're deriving the uncertainties from our data. Uh, rather than using the minimization engines directly to determine the, the error bars, we're actually using a bootstrapping process uh, to assess the error bars in our data. Uh, on the left image, you can see the, the diameter of the F-star that's predicted. The best fit from Levmar is this top with an incredibly tiny error bar. However, through the bootstrapping process, we find out that we have about 1% error in the diameter of the star. Uh, but if you look at the limb darkening coefficient, we end up with about 10% error, or a little bit more than 10% error, which is consistent with the angular diameter error of our calibrator. So we have fairly realistic uncertainties. Okay. So the conclusions from my talk is that uh, OI imagery construction is quite tricky and you have to pay careful attention to the artifacts, at least at the present time. 
And then with Epsilon Origi, from our interferometric observations, we significantly constrain the orbit. The disk is asymmetric. Mid-eclipse brightening is not due to a central clearing in the disk, and that we have fairly uh, interesting, uh, uh, fairly realistic uncertainties. And the publication on this work should be coming out uh, very soon. Okay, so uh, I guess now we'll open up to questions. Uh, if I'm not available for Skype, please feel free to, feel free to contact me via email at bkloppen at mpifr.de. That's the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Uh, or you can scan the QR code in the upper right-hand corner of the screen uh, to get a copy of this presentation uh, um, from my website. Thank you very much.